Hi, I'm Frank Thomas. Today I'm going to present you with a short presentation on Merle's first principles of instruction. Let's start with who developed the first principles of instruction. David Merrill. He is a professor emeritus at Utah State University. Dr. Merrill has a PhD from the University of Illinois and over 50 years of experience studying instruction and instructional design. Some of his principal contributions to the field include component displacement theory, elaboration theory, instructional transaction theory, and first principles of instruction. Merle's first principles of instruction was developed in 2002 after decades of research in instructional design. First principles are simply fundamental principles that apply to all successful instructional programs and practices. The goal behind Merrill's years of research was to identify what he called E to the third power or E3 learning. That is instruction that resulted in learning because it was effective, efficient, and engaging. Merrill pulled common pieces or best practices of many instructional design models together into a list of fundamental principles. The results were five fundamental principles of instructional design. The first principle of instructional design is that instruction should be problem-centered. Merrill states that learning is facilitated when the learner is engaged in solving real-world problems. Learning connected to real life is more interesting to the learner. Many teachers often starts less, start lessons with a phenomenon or a problem that hooks the learner into the content. Next, instruction must involve activation. Learning is promoted when existing knowledge is activated as a foundation for new knowledge. Connecting to prior knowledge is an important part of the learning process. Activation can be as simple as asking questions about previous lessons or about a childhood experience that could be relatable to the content. The third principle of instruction is demonstration. Learning is promoted when new knowledge is demonstrated to the learner. In order for instruction to be effective, the student must not only be told, but also be shown what he or she is expected to do. The fourth principle is application. Merrill states that learning is facilitated when the learner is required to use his or her new knowledge to solve a problem. Learning becomes concrete when the learner applies the knowledge and has a chance to practice the skill. The final principle is integration. Merle proposed that learning is promoted when the new knowledge is integrated into the learner's world. Once the learner has had the opportunity to practice the skill, they need a chance to use the skill in a real life setting. Once the learner can effectively use the knowledge of the skill in a real life situation, the instructor knows that the instruction has been successful. One study by Joel Gardner titled How Award-Winning Professors in Higher Education Use Merle's First Principles of Instruction investigated the use of Merle's First Principles of Instruction by successful professors. Gardner studied the methods of four award-winning professors at a large Western university. His research confirmed that the use of all or almost all of Merle's first principles in every one of the experts' instructions. A second study, applying first principles of instruction as a design theory of a flipped classroom, also researched the effectiveness of Merrill's first principles. Authors Lowe, La, and Hugh studied the use of Merrill's first principles in a set of flipped classrooms in two high schools using five teachers, approximately 380 students, and four subject areas. Classroom and online instruction were designed using first principles of instruction and the results were studied. Results suggested that Merrill's first principles of instruction is an effective model to follow when developing flipped classroom instruction. Three of the four contents, student achievement, increased as a result of using this model. Merle's first principles of instruction can be used to teach any subject matter. It is an excellent guide to developing instruction. For example, a coach wanting to teach his players how to shoot a floater. First, the coach would introduce a problem that his players would be familiar with, like a guard who drives by his defender, but then the second line of defense is between him and the rim. What does he do now? 
How can he turn this into a positive play instead of a turnover? The coach would then explain the idea of a floater and tie it back to the skills and the knowledge that they already had about dribbling, shooting, and shooting off the dribble. After activating the prior knowledge, the coach would demonstrate shooting a floater, pointing out the keys to success. The coach would not only teach the skill of the floater, but also teach them when to use the skill. After the demonstration, the coach would simply set up a few drills that give the players an opportunity to practice and apply the new skills and knowledge. Coaching, reteaching, and demonstration would continue in this phase as needed. The coach would gradually adjust the drills, making it more and more game-like. Once the coach saw adequate progress, the coach would encourage the players to integrate the skill of shooting a floater into live scrimmage action. When the player feels confident with the skills in the drills and in live scrimmage, they would automatically begin to integrate the floater into their offensive arsenal in live game action. Merle's first principles of instruction are broad fundamental principles that are essential to effective, efficient, engaging instruction. Most experienced instructors use these principles intuitively. Thank you.